Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Ryan K. Meyer. I'm one of the new neuroimmunologists at the University of Colorado and Children's Hospital Colorado, working for both pediatric and adult patients with autoimmune disorders and autoimmune encephalitis. And uh, I'm here to talk to you today about anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. So anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis is a disorder that causes brain inflammation um, and occurs most often in young adults and teenagers, and usually in people who are female, um, more often than males. Um, so some of my disclosures, I am an advisory board member for Genetech, but uh, does not have relevant, sorry. Oh, um, I thought you were about to say something. No, sorry. <laughs> Um, but not related to uh, this particular talk. Uh, so to try to understand anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, uh, we have to talk a little bit about the immune system and how it can dysfunction in autoimmune encephalitis. And so to start with, the immune system is very complex and still something people learn more about every year. Uh, it works to protect us from infections, but it also has a role in fighting tumors and cleaning up and repairing after damage that occurs within our body. There are a number of cells that are involved in the immune system. Most of these are what we term white blood cells, but there are also cells that reside within each tissue permanently that work to detect anything abnormal. Um, all the cells in our immune system pass information between each other and work to alert and support each other if they detect any abnormality. Um, and so obviously this would be a problem if the immune system started to be overvigilant and start to signal other cells to attack parts of a healthy body. When this happens, uh, it is an autoimmune disease. And there's a few ways that we neurologists have learned how an autoimmune disease can develop against the NMDA receptors. So there's a lot to see on this slide. And um, so we're gonna start on the left hand side of the slide. We're gonna go around in a clockwise fashion through the slide and uh, go through the different changes in the immune system that happen with NMDA encephalitis. Uh, so NMDA encephalitis, uh, one way that it can start is if there's an infection that damages a part of the brain. And this is seen most often with a very severe brain infection called herpes simplex virus or HSV encephalitis. So this virus damages parts of the brain and the immune system, the dendritic cells in the brain seen here, uh, try to help by cleaning up and fighting the virus. Uh, unfortunately, because of all the damaged tissue, they also start to recognize damaged neurons and NMDA receptors as being part of the infection and then start signaling the rest of the immune system, the T cells, the B cells, and the plasma cells um, to make antibodies against the NMDA receptors and to keep up the fight against the neurons. And so the antibodies then go and attach to the receptors seen down here on the neurons and which prevents the usual and normal communication between the neurons, sometimes over firing the cells or sometimes under firing them. A second way that these antibodies can be produced is if the immune system sees a tumor in the body, most commonly a tumor called a teratoma in the ovaries that also has the NMDA receptor on it. When the body starts to fight the tumor, then the immune system also starts to recognize the NMDA receptor as part of the tumor. And if those immune cells and antibodies reach the brain, it could start the encephalitis. So the immune system has become overprotective and is starting to think that the NMDA receptor is something bad for the body and is starting to attack it. So what symptoms do you start to see when encephalitis starts? The first that may occur before any of the neurologic symptoms is a virus-like illness. It could be a fever, a headache, a nose cold, or something similar. We aren't sure exactly why this happens, but maybe that there's a ramping up the, of the immune system during this time. Next is the main set of changes in neurologic and psychiatric changes we see with NMDA encephalitis, which is usually what is bringing people to the hospital. 
They may have psychiatric symptoms such as intense hallucinations, a big change in personality or strange behavior, um, starting to go without any sleep and being uh, having a lot of issues with insomnia. You might see seizures or abnormal wiggling movements of their hands that they can't control called chorea. Uh, we also see memory issues and confusion and uh, people can have difficulty talking, sometimes becoming mute. Uh, may start having difficulty with their breathing or their heart rates too. Often they have a combination of all of these coming together um, over the course of a few days to a few weeks. Um, and this is an important point. Uh, when all these symptoms start coming together, um, getting evaluated is crucial because this is one of the times when our treatments can help the most in promoting recovery. Without treatments, people will continue to decline, sometimes even entering a coma, and they may be stuck in this low state for some time, struggling through the encephalitis. Uh, finally, after treatment, which we'll talk about here in a bit, there's a gradual recovery. The biggest change happens within the first few weeks after calming down the inflammation with treatment, and uh, then we'll still see continuing improvements for even up to two years as the body works to heal itself and as we work to prevent any inflammation from recurring and causing setbacks in the recovery. Uh, so there's a number of things that we do for evaluation and diagnosis for people who have the symptoms that we might see with NMDA encephalitis or other autoimmune encephalitis. Um, so we may do blood tests to look for other causes of uh, confusion or other causes of seizures. Um, we will sometimes test for the NMDA antibodies in the blood, but um, while you can see this both in the blood and the spinal fluid, it's important to know that uh, a number of healthy people can have the NMDA receptor antibody in their blood and not have encephalitis and not have symptoms related to inflammation. And so uh, what's most important is doing a lumbar puncture, looking for inflammation, and then looking for the antibody um, being present in the spinal fluid where it definitely should not be and where it would directly cause um, difficulties with encephalitis. Um, MRIs may sometimes show clues of the encephalitis, but more often it is useful in ensuring that there's not other causes for the seizures or uh, changes that are being noted. An electroencephalogram, um, a test that looks at brain waves, is often abnormal and it can show either encephalopathy, which is confusion, or may show a tendency towards seizures that the brain is more irritable than it should be. And we will also look for tumors um, because removing a tumor like a teratoma associated with NMDA encephalitis will help decrease the immune system's activation against the tumor and therefore decrease its activation against the NMDA receptors as well. Um, there's two ma major components to treatment, um, immunotherapies and supportive care. And so there is no agreed upon set of immune therapies that doctors use. Each hospital will likely do something that's a little bit different, um, but all are focused on trying to decrease inflammation um, in different ways. Um, there are some trials that are being set up to try to come up with the most effective treatment, and hopefully we'll have more information on that in the next few years. Our approach seems to be what is typical for most other doctors that treat this encephalitis. We start quickly with IV steroids because it helps calm down the inflammation most quickly. And then we start plasma exchange, which is removal of part of the blood fluid containing the NMDA receptor antibodies and replace it with fresh and clean plasma, um, which can also help to quickly calm down inflammation. Uh, then we give doses of medications that uh, selectively work on the immune system to decrease the antibody producing cells in the blood, um, also known as the B cells. So by doing this, this protocol is helpful in starting and sustaining that upslope to recovery. And we expect to see some good improvements shortly after the steroids and plaques are started. If that does not occur and the inflammation is especially difficult to calm, there are other immune therapies that we use, uh, but these have higher infection risks. And so we only use them if needed. 
Um, so supportive care is also very critical for recovery, um, and it has a number of different parts to it. Um, as we mentioned, finding and removing a tumor helps stop the misguided immune response. Uh, Anti-seizure medications can help calm down the seizures so that the brain can cover without the seizures, uh, changing the brain chemistry even more. Um, but these rarely need to be permanent once we've calmed down the inflammation. Psychiatric medications are very helpful to calm the hallucinations, the mania, or the insomnia that we see with MMDA encephalitis. And finally, therapies such as physical, occupational, speech therapy, and rehabilitation are needed to continue to strengthen the body and mind after the encephalitis and ensure continuing recovery. The path to recovery is long, and therapies and restrengthening takes a long time and effort, um, both from our patients and their families. But with that effort, we see people make good progress towards their prior selves. We know that the earlier treatment is started, the better the likelihood is of this happening. While most people are able to go back to work and school, there may be some lingering changes from the injury, either some difficulties with school, attention, memory, fatigue, or anxiety or mood changes that weren't there prior to the in injury. So people may continue to need assistance or modifications in school to some degree, and may continue to need some form of psychiatric help. Although we know that these things can happen, even with the best treatment of inflammation, our goal is try to, to try to reduce any of these residual symptoms as best we can by making sure that the inflammation is treated quickly and effectively, that supportive care is helping things um, in recovery to continue to move along, and by participating in research on determining the optimal treatment strategies uh, for this disease. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you'd like to learn more, um, there's a number of patient organizations that are focused on helping people with autoimmune encephalitis and their families. Um, some of the websites and some of the organizations to look at include the International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society, the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance, and um, as you're seeing today, there's also information and, uh, at the Rocky Mountain MS Center. Um, so our partner organization uh, helps with much more than just multiple sclerosis. And uh, so a number of our patients and families autoimmune encephalitis uh, also can be helped through their services. Um, so again, thank you for your attention and uh, please reach out if you have any questions.